All right, so welcome everybody. I'm uh, Andrew Bouchard. I'm one of the transplant cardiologists here at St. Joe's. I'm joined by Sonia here. So we'll have the pleasure of arguing for the pro side um, that all um, African American or black patients should be offered genetic screening for TTR amyloidosis. So as far as um, when we look at cardiac disease as a whole, when you look at black Americans compared to white patients, black Americans are more likely to develop congestive heart failure and to do so actually at an earlier age compared to um, their Caucasian counterparts. They've also got a 2.5 increased risk of hospitalization for heart failure. They have higher rates of myocardial infarction and worse outcomes after acute coronary events. And they're 30% they're more likely to die of such disease than their Caucasian counterparts. So if we just look at cardiology as a whole, we're already looking at a very vulnerable population to start with. When it comes to ATTR cardiomyopathy uh, in and of itself, it's a life-threatening disease. I don't have to speak to this crowd. You guys know that very well. And it disproportionately affects older adults as well as African-American patients. Um, the older adults were sort of um, addressed in the previous debates, and I'm not sure how many of you guys were at the previous debate. Um, but today, we're here to talk about those of African descent. And when you look at the specific mutation involved in these cases, we're specifically talking about the valine to isoleucine uh, mutation. It's far by, by far more common in black Americans in the USA, comprising about 5% of the population. Um, when you look at West African populations on their own, it hits about 5% of West African populations. In a single study, if you look at the UK, we're not talking about the, a disease process that's isolated to a certain part of the world. We're talking about the disease process that affects everyone on a multinational level. So if you look at a single center referral um, uh, process in the UK, when they looked at the valine to isoleucine mutation, they found that it actually affects about 43% of those with ATTR cardiomyopathy in that single center in the UK. And when they specifically looked at that population, they found that 50% of that population were of Afro-Caribbean or black descent. So this is a huge number of patients that we're talking about that are affected by this mutation. And finally, when they looked at a Theos multinational registry, that's a transthyretin uh, amyloidosis outcome survey, this looked at both European as well as North American populations. About 2,500 patients, 300 in the USA, and a couple thousand elsewhere in that 300 in the USA, 25% were black Americans. And when you look elsewhere, about 0.5% were black Americans. So this is something that hits at home, okay? This is something that we need to address here in the USA. Okay, um, so just to provide a little bit of background, most of us know that uh, hereditary amyloidosis is caused by pathogenic variants or mutations in the TTR gene. And this gene is located on chromosome 18 and it encodes for the transthyretin protein, uh, which is a homotetrameric carrier protein that's involved primarily in retinol transport and thyroid hormone transport, as well as may be involved in some other intracellular processes. Um, pathogenic variants in this gene are associated with amyloid deposition, which is how we get amyloidosis, predominantly affecting the peripheral nerves and the heart, although we know that it can build up in other parts of the body, causing complications like carpal tunnel syndrome, kidney disease, and digestive issues. Uh, TTR variants are inherited in an autosomal dominant pattern. So any individual who's affected with this condition, their children have a 50% chance to inherit that disease-causing variant and also be at risk for the condition. We expect that the variant was inherited from a parent, so we think that the expected risk to parents or other siblings of the affected individual is also 50%. Um, and about 150 or so disease-causing variants have been identified. 
This condition is also characterized by incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. Um, so not all individuals who have a disease causing variant will develop disease. And for those that do develop disease, symptoms may present at different ages or different severity levels, depending on the individual, even within the same family. So just to talk a little bit more about that V142I variant that Dr. Boshara introduced, um, also sometimes called the V122I variant, depending on the naming system that is being used, um, it's disproportionately more prevalent in individuals af of African descent. Um, like he mentioned, approximately three to 4% of African Americans carry this variant, and that's even higher uh, prevalence in some areas of West Africa, and this compares to a prevalence of up to about 1.6% in the general population worldwide. Uh, the paper that this graphic is from also notes that this is the most commonly identified TTR variant and accounts for up to about 79% of hereditary cardiac amyloidosis cases. And for individuals who carry this particular variant, it's estimated that at least 75 are of African descent based off this paper. Uh, age of symptom onset is around 63 years old, um, but diagnosis is not typically until several years later. So this really demonstrates the concern for later diagnosis and later implementation of appropriate treatment. Um, and while the true penetrance of this variant is really not well defined, um, it's thought that there's significantly higher risk for incident heart failure in carriers compared to non-carriers, as well as lower reported survival um, compared to other types of cardiac amyloidosis. So when we look at the racial disparities in cardiac amyloidosis, with African Americans specifically with hereditary ATTR, they present with more advanced disease compared to their Caucasian counterparts and those with wild type TTR. Um, and that's despite them having a non-invasive method for early detection, um, namely genetic testing as well as echocardiography. They have a median survival of about 25.6 months versus the 43 months that's associated with the wild type. They have twice the risk, like Sonia was mentioning, they have twice the risk of incident heart failure compared to non-carriers, and they're disproportionately underrepresented in the clinical trials. And that's a huge point here. Um, despite the high burden of ATTR cardiomyopathy among black individuals, most clinical data is actually from non-black individuals and individuals from Europe, which, as we mentioned earlier, underrepresented black Americans several studies. Um, in addition to racial differences, there are huge socioeconomic disparities when it comes to afford affordability as well as accessibility to disease-modifying medications. So that's something that we need to keep in mind with this population. So when it comes to what are the pros of testing um, all black adults for um, ATTR cardiomyopathy, we're talking about early education. This is to raise awareness of the signs, symptoms, and resources in those who are identified to have the mutation so that they can plan accordingly. This is to notify at-risk relatives and to allow for cascade testing. When we talk about education specifically, um, Dr. Dev Sandesh presented a slide earlier showing that even within the USA itself, there are huge geographic variations as far as both the diagnosis as well as the management of amyloidosis. The highest mortality rates that you can see were actually centered around amyloid referral centers and amyloid referral states. But when you look at the South, the South has the highest black American populations, and those are underreporting mortalities when it comes to amyloidosis. And that's an issue with education. That's an issue with diagnosis. Okay. When we look at patients with ATTR cardiomyopathy that are identified, the median time from onset of cardiac symptoms to the time of diagnosis is about three to five years. We're already behind the eight ball when it comes to these patients. So rather than be reactive, we need to start being proactive and we need to start testing these patients ahead of the diagnosis of their, um, their phenotype. When we talk about medication accessibility, it was presented in the earlier discussion with the older patients, screening for older patients, that the cost of tafamidis is exorbitantly high. And this is because this, has, this is a disease that's been labeled 
as a very rare disease. And so tafamidis has come across as an orphan drug, okay? If you start testing more patients genetically and identifying more patients, this no longer becomes that rare disease. This no longer becomes a disease where we need to rely on orphan drugs to treat it, okay? This is, this is something that can really, genetic testing is something that can really push the bounds and really allow for higher accessibility for medications going forward for these patients. All right, so in current practice, there are situations in which it is important to discuss genetic testing for hereditary amyloidosis, one of which is when a patient is diagnosed with TTR cardiac amyloidosis. Um, genetic testing is recommended for all of those patients, regardless of age, to differentiate between wild type and hereditary amyloidosis. It can help better characterize clinical manifestations, prognosis, guide treatment selection, and really highlights the importance of screening for family members who could be at risk. Um, another situation, kind of segueing from family members being at risk, is family members of individuals who have a known TTR pathogenic variant who are interested in predictive testing to better understand what their risk might look like. And one uh, paper by an expert group suggested an approach to presymptomatic genetic testing in at-risk relatives, um, as well as screening in asymptomatic carriers. So it's important that asymptomatic individuals undergo appropriate pretest counseling um, to discuss the benefits and limitations of genetic testing for them at that point in time. This should include discussion of possible changes in medical management, family dynamics, psychological impact, um, and insurance or financial implications. And it's important to note that testing in asymptomatic minors is always considered a, uh, inappropriate, uh, but for adults who choose to undergo this type of testing and test positive for a disease-causing variant, it's suggested to begin monitoring for symptoms around 10 years earlier than the predicted onset age, which is impacted by the variant type, family history, um, and expected age that that variant might present. So with that being said, um, there's still many affected individuals who are misdiagnosed um, or diagnosed much later than they should be, like we've talked about. And one of the reasons that this genetic diagnosis might be overlooked is due to a seemingly negative family history. Um, we might think that with a dominant condition, we should see a really strong family history of symptoms, but we actually see that inheritance can be masked by multiple factors. Could be that there's failure to recognize that a family member's symptoms are caused by amyloidosis, um, there could be the early death of a parent before they might develop symptoms, or a parent might not develop symptoms until later in life, or may never develop symptoms because of that incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. And another point to consider um, when it comes to genetic testing for hereditary amyloidosis is that TTR gene analysis is already universally available on direct-to-consumer or DTC genetic testing. Anyone can purchase this testing in store or online um, and submit a saliva sample to get various genetic information, um, which often can include the presence or absence of the three most common variants, including that V142I variant. Um, so for patients who haven't had pretest counseling by a medical provider, they don't have a known family history, this might be very surprising. They might not be expecting a risk result or really prepared to process the significance of that result. Um, but there are resources out there for uh, healthcare professionals who want to help interested patients access clinical genetic testing um, to better understand their risk for this condition. Uh, there's um, options for doing testing via saliva sample or blood draw, very simple collection process. Commercial send out labs often have insurance billing assistance to help patients better understand their financial responsibilities. And typically there's an alternative $250 self pay price for testing. Um, and then for patients who actually have a known family history or who have suspicious symptoms of the condition, there are sponsored testing options out there to help patients get no charge genetic testing. Um, so many providers might not be comfortable or trained to provide this pretest counseling that we know is important, but that's what genetic counselors are for. And there are resources for providers to access genetic counseling services, whether that's referring to counselors at local hospitals or clinics, um, genetic counselors may be on staff at the testing laboratory that testing is ordered through, or providers can partner with a telehealth company that provides these services for pretest counseling. Um, I also always just like to point out the find a genetic counselor resource that's available online where you can find a genetic counselor. <laughs>
Um, so we just like to wrap up with a case example of a patient that I saw in clinic. Um, this gentleman had self-referred to discuss his direct-to-consumer testing. He was really motivated when he did the testing to find out more information about his genetics. His ancestry results showed Nigerian and other West African ancestry, and his health screening results showed that he carried that V122I uh, variant. So he had never heard of amyloidosis before his results, and naturally he starts Googling things and becomes really concerned about the symptoms that he sees online, and he starts becoming hyper aware and concerned that any changes that in feelings that he's having is onset of symptoms. Um, so I really wanted to be sure that we touched on a couple of things. One, that we needed to do clinical confirmation testing because it's different than direct-to-consumer testing. There is a good chance it would come back positive, and it did. Um, but on top of that, we wanted to really uh, adjust expectations, you know, kind of ease anxieties of the things we might not expect with this variant while confirming some of those clinical risks that were relevant to him. Um, and it allowed for follow-up education for his family members as well to announce that they're at risk too. They can get genetic testing and counseling. Um, it allowed for evaluation of him and referral to our multidisciplinary amyloid team, shout out to those in the back, um, to help with follow-up screening and management. So because he chose to pursue this testing and follow up with counseling, he was able to better understand his own genetic information and access these benefits. And with 4% of our African-American population having an expected test result like this patient, we think that these individuals should be offered the opportunity to have those benefits as well. Thank you.